Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the College of Engineering virtual brown bag series for the fall semester. Uh, we have just started the series yet again, as you know. Um, during COVID, we have been having this virtual series and it's been well attended. Lots of interesting talks. Uh, today is the first uh, faculty talk. It's going to be focused on research. And uh, uh, before I get into presenting the speaker, I just wanted to tell you that uh, I myself, I'm the, going to be the host for today. I'm uh, Gautam Das, I'm the Associate Dean for Research College of Engineering, and I've been you know, hosting these research series for the last uh, semester or two. Uh, it gives me great pleasure today to introduce uh, our very own Professor Degan Park, who's an Assistant Professor in the Computer Science and Engineering Department here at UTA. And uh, before I talk about his presentation, uh, just a brief bio. Uh, so, as I said, he's an assistant professor here in the CSE department uh, at ETA. He leads the Human Data Interaction Lab here, which studies the human level AI, which is really the topic of today's lecture. Dr. Park earned his doctoral degree from the University of Maryland in College Park 2018. And he has licensed patents to companies, including Samsung Electronics. Uh, he completed an MS in Interdisciplinary Engineering at Purdue University and an MS in Biomedical Engineering at Seoul National University, where he obtained a BS degree in Electrical Engineering. So you can see a whole bunch of different degrees. Uh, he worked at the government and industry research labs and startups. Uh, today's uh, talk is titled uh, Programming Human Level AI. Very intriguing. I'm also myself curious to learn more about it. Um, so what Dr. Park says is that uh, he will present his own research on programming human level AI, which he calls HLAI. And he's going to focus on three things. One is uh, he's going to define what HLAI is. That's kind of important. Uh, secondly, he will talk about an, an environment to develop and test HLAI, which is uh, part of his research. And the third is a cognitive architecture for HLAI. So he's going to present all of that. So before I ask Dr. Park to start his presentation, um, just a couple of uh, notes to the audience. Uh, uh, please uh, notice that uh, you know, if you're at, as you're attending virtually, there is a chat window where uh, whenever you feel the urge to ask a question, please type your question in the chat window. And I'll be looking at that chat window and uh, we will not interrupt uh, Dr. Park. He will uh, give his presentation and we will have ample time towards the end to the, do the Q and A's. And once I see your questions, I'll read them out to him at the end and we'll give him the opportunity to respond. So Dirgan, it's all yours now. Thank you, Gautam. Uh, so, uh, let's start with uh, what do we mean by human level AI, HLAI. Uh, so let me give you one concrete example. This is a, a famous cartoon and this robot called Rossi can do many things like uh, cooking, cleaning, taking care of your pets, talking with other uh, robots. And you can use uh, natural language to ask services and that is will be the what I mean by uh, human level AI. And to build a, such a robot, definitely you need a hardware and software part. And it looks like hardware part is somewhat ready. Why we don't know how we can program such a robot. So my research goal has been how we can uh, program such a bottle robot. And in today's talk, I will introduce uh, three uh, parts of the, about uh, that goal, theory, test, and model. So theory is uh, just, uh, uh, I introduce a few terms, uh, like uh, so that we can build a common ground where we discuss. And in the test part, I introduce what is an EG but sufficient test for human level AI. And in the last part, 
we will talk about how can we actually program one. And here is the disclaimer. Uh, this is a definitely work in progress and there will be no fancy virtual robot video in the talk. So theory part. Uh, theory, I would like to clarify a few terms such as uh, what is intelligence, learning, or human level AI, and language. So what, let's start with a question. What is intelligence? Today, AI, artificial intelligence is really popular. But if you ask 70 uh, computer scientists or psychologists, what is intelligence? You will get 70 different versions of the definition. So let's use uh, one concrete example. Is it an earthworm intelligence? Think about what you think. So that is, the answer will definitely depend on what do we mean by the intelligence. So as we said, there are many different uh, definitions. And Shane and uh, Hutter and Shane Leg here, he is a co-founder of the Deep Mind. And when he was a graduate student with uh, Marcus Hutter, he actually surveyed like a 72 different definitions of the intelligence. And they came up with a universal intelligence as a definition for intelligence. And this is how it goes. Intelligence measure an agent's ability to achieve goals in a wide range of environment. And this is called universal intelligence. What is nice thing about this definition is it can be applied to many different things like uh, us worms, dogs, cats, human, even computer programs. So uh, if we apply, uh, in, if we look at this perspective, intelligence is uh, the ability to do appropriate behaviors according to the sensor input. And you can see given sensory signals as an input, generating appropriate uh, behavior will be the main function of the intelligence. And if we look at in this perspective, we can say earthworms have a intelligence because it has a sensors like a light sensors, vibration sensors, and it avoids sun and it avoids a predator and it does feed, mate, and survive in a dynamic, harsh environment. In that sense, we can say earthworms have a intelligence. So this shows another way of looking at, we have an environment where we get the observations and uh, observations are fed into the sensory system and control system, which will be the main unit for intelligence, determines what will be the appropriate behaviors and action system uh, conducts such a behavior. And what is unique about the earthworms case is that this control system is updated by evolution. Definitely earthworms do not learn new tricks. Uh, they just learn how to do appropriate behaviors by evolution. If there was a 100 earthworms and 50 decide to go closer to the sun and 50 decide to avoid the sun and uh, those who avoid the sun survive and that's how they uh, are able to avoid the sun because they are the only survived uh, earthworms. So, however, we would not be so interested in the replicating the earthworms intelligence in uh, AI. So, there might be levels of the intelligence. So, let's call uh, earthworm-like intelligence level one intelligence because they are the lowest intelligent animals that I can think. And the characteristics are there will be no individual learning. However, the uh, refinement update on the control systems are done on, by the evolution. So what's the problem with the level of intelligence? The problem is update is too slow. Think of, imagine there is a meteor, meteor strike on Earth the climate change 
suddenly, then if you don't know how to adapt to this environment quickly, you will get it uh, extinct. So the solution might be if an individual agent can learn new skills, and that's how, uh, how I say rats, cats, and dogs learn new skills. So there are a few mechanisms, but basically we use a reward signal. So if you get a reward when you do some behavior, then you uh, learn new skills. So that's how uh, level two animals. So the characteristics of the level two animals is that they learn from direct experience and there is a reward-based refinement. We can say rats and dogs belong to this categorization. And what will be the limit of the, this level two intelligence? Think you are a rabbit and you never seen tiger before in your life. And if you try to learn what will be the appropriate behavior by random exploration, it will be too late for you to update your lessons. That means uh, there are actually very limited things that you can learn with a direct experience. And more, even for the level two intelligence animals, most of your behaviors are done by uh, instinct or level one in, uh, intelligence. So how we can overcome those uh, limitation, which I will call level three in, uh, intelligence, the trick is, what if, if we can learn from indirect experience? So if we can uh, learn from uh, others' uh, experience. So think of the monkeys and you give them a box with a trick, difficult trick to open it. And monkeys are frustrated because they cannot open it. But when one monkey suddenly learn uh, find how to open it, other monkeys can imitate, observe it and imitate how you can do that. So this behavior called observational learning or social learning is found on many uh, animals like uh, primates, invertebrates, birds, birds, rats, and reptiles. So that's not uh, unique with a human. What is unique with a human is that humans can learn from direct experience using language, which is uh, just a sequence of abstract symbols. And so far, only humans are known species uh, using language to learn uh, new skills. So we can define human level intelligence as a level three intelligence with a language as a tool. However, what do we mean by the using language? So dolphins use a verbal sign to communicate. Monkeys learn the sign language. You can talk to uh, Google or Siri or uh, Alexa. And there are many AI agents that claims that they uh, learn how to do language skills. Do they have a human level intelligence? So let me explain the the essence of learning with a language, with a concrete example. Let's say you have never seen cola before in your life, and now you are seeing this dark sparkling drink. And with a random exploration, you have an option to run away or drink it, and you decide to try it. And it felt good, it gave you reward. And with this experience, which is a state action and reward sequence, now, next time when you see the cola, you are more likely to drink it rather than run away from it. So this is called policy update by experience. That is how level two intelligence learn, uh, animals learns. And learning with a language means, let's say your friends come to you and you know what? Uh, cola is a black sparkling drink and yesterday I drank it and it tasted good. So 
you never seen the cola in your um, sensory system. You just heard abstract sequence of symbols. And with these uh, abstract symbols, if next time you see a dark black sparkling drink, and if you are more likely to drink it, then we can say you are doing policy update by language. And if they have a similar effect, we can say you are able to learn with a language. And if we apply this uh, standard, we can say many of the, uh, those skills are not uh, enough language skills. So they are not uh, human level AI. A little formal way of defining human level AI would be an agent has a human level intelligence if there exists a symbolic description for every feasible sensory input and action sequence such that the agent can update the behavior policy equally, whether it receives the symbolic description or what, it experiences the sensory input and the action sequence itself. So that was a little uh, obvious way of defining it. Then also what I mean by the uh, theory where I just, uh, we share the common definition about what is the uh, intelligence learning human level intelligence and language. And in our second part of the talk, let me introduce what might be a sufficient but easy task for the task of human level AI. And why sufficient but easy? Because there has been many sufficient but difficult tests, such as a Turing test, robot college student test, kitchen test, AI preschool test, and so on. Uh, let me introduce what is a robot college student test. Uh, let's say if there is a robot or a program and it attend the class and take exam and do assignment as a uh, human student does, and if it can get a uh, college degree, then we can say this robot or AI program has a human level intelligence. That is uh, what Robo College student test means. That is uh, uh, quite uh, challenging. I'm sure if an algorithm or a robot or a program can do that, I'm sure they have a uh, human level intelligence. But the problem is they are just too difficult to be practical for uh, our research. So that might be the reason why you never see uh, those tests on the papers in the uh, AI conferences. Uh, in other spectrum, there are many easy but not sufficient tests. Uh, let me introduce a few. Uh, we know Grad Schema Challenge, it is a, a difficult test in the language skill. Imaginous Challenge, uh, AlphaGo playing Go or AlphaStar playing StarCraft game. And there are uh, multitask benchmark in natural language such as a glue or a super glue or a multitask benchmark in reinforcement learning. So uh, those are many tests that is uh, quite interesting and there has been many progress with these those tests. But the problem is even though a program can play StarCraft better than me, it does not mean it has a human level intelligence and if it can classify object as a photo of the uh, object such as a dog cat it's a quite interesting but it does not guarantee you that you how you can achieve a uh, human level intelligence so let me introduce an alternative based on uh, observation that if you have a cat baby, monkey baby, and raise them like a human baby, they cannot learn language. And if you raise a, a human baby in a jungle alone, then they cannot learn language. So in the case of the cat baby or monkey baby, we can say they are capability limited. And in the case of the uh, human baby in the jungle, we, say, we can say they are environmentally limited. 
So language acquisition is a function of environment and capability. In other words, if given the proper environment, if the agent can learn language, we can say it has a capability for human-like artificial intelligence. So that's uh, uh, what I name language acquisition test for human level AI. So we can uh, measure the uh, policy update after they go through the direct experience or uh, indirect experience with the language. However, the caveat here is uh, what do we mean by the proper environment? So definitely there is a mother or uh, your family social system trying to teach you languages. And having those is uh, uh, using humans to teach you language has been tried, but I can say it's uh, expensive, both time and money and they are not reproducible, and they are not ideal for model research. So my student and I have been working on the simulated environment for language acquisition. So in this simulated environment, which can be sought as a game for AI agent, there will be a mother character who is taking care of the baby, and the mother character tries to teach language to this uh, learning agent, which, uh, which is a baby. So in this case, you can see the mother is saying uh, bear, uh, pointing the bear towards the baby. And on the right, you can see what the actually baby sees and hears. So in central, which uh, the learning agent has a human-like multi-sensory uh, input, like a touch sensor and uh, stereo cameras and proprioceptors and things like that. Uh, however, the challenging part is uh, programming model character, if you think about it, because model character has to do random but reasonable behavior uh, to uh, behavior according to the behaviors of the baby. So how we can pro, uh, tackle this challenge is we program model characters by consulting with the developmental psychologist, uh, considering what are essential interactions with the model and write a new scenario for it. And we act and motion capture behavior of model and add the scenario to environment. This is how uh, your PlayStation game might have the, how I say, uh, reasonably human-like behavior. And this is a, a motion capture facility in our lab. So here is a little more technical detail. Uh, this kind of approach where the uh, building an environment to teach language to the learning agent there have been many uh, experiments. So let me, uh, it, here we you can see some screenshots. So in chapter 2018, for example, you are given instruction like uh, go to the small red object. And if you go to small red object, you get a reward. And what is quite remarkable about this uh, program is, let's say you run red object, or red pillar or uh, short pillar, but let's say you never seen the green short pillar in the uh, training time. But at the test time, when you say go to green short pillar, you can go to green short pillar, meaning that it learned the compositionality of the language. And there are more uh, uh, environment like that. And key differences of our approach to previous works is that in previous works, there are a specific tasks you have to do, and if you achieve that task, you get reward. However, we think that is how the agent is overfitted to specific tasks and not generalized like a human. So in this environment, we do not provide our specific task or reward. 
and we provide a human-like experience, uh, and we provide a longitudinal development. So that was the uh, introduction of the uh, what is a sufficient but easy task for the task uh, test of human level AI. And now let's go to the main uh, meet main challenge of today's talk. How can you actually program a model for human level AI? So let me, let us compare the uh, how I say we call uh, AI as a invention of the thinking machine, and there uh, previously there has been invention of flying machine. So invention of thinking machine and invention of the flying machine, they have a uh, many common aspect. First, we have a uh, ground truth answers from the nature. In the case of the flying machine, we have a uh, birds flying around us. So we know something that is heavier than the air can fly. But if we try to copy exactly same, then it will be actually very challenging to imitate how birds fly. Even with today's technology, we are far from uh, imitating the exact mechanism of how birds fly. Or if we ignore the uh, birds too much, like a uh, uh, building a, a flying carpet, then we were not successful. So we should be careful when we copy someone else's answer. So there is a, a right level of, of the uh, copying where we can learn scientific principle. And once we learn the scientific principle, we can uh, try different uh, hyperparameters and build a different way of flying, but still they rely on the uh, same underlying principle. If we compare uh, the flying machine, what is the ground truth for thinking machine? We have a brain, human brain, there are human brains as a nature's answer for how to build a thinking machine. Okay, again, there can be a, a copying too much or copying too little. Uh, but in general, we as a community has been focused on the how we can get right principle from the uh, behavior uh, brain and things like uh, attention or reinforcement learning, recurrent neural network, conversational neural network. Those are uh, good examples of the uh, principles. So in uh, if we look at the brain, brain is for behaviors. Organisms that don't move don't have brains. Trees don't have brains. And sea squirrels, uh, when they are young, they float around the sea moving. When they are young, they have brain. But when they uh, settle down, when they don't move, they don't need brain. They eat or reserves or they observe most of its brain. So uh, brain is for behaviors. And we learned that there are uh, innate behavior like instinct and uh, learned behaviors. So there might be two different mechanisms for generating uh, instinct behavior and then learned behavior. So let's start with uh, our learned behavior, where most of this is happening on neocortex and cerebellum. So if you look at the, uh, how I say, neocortex like this, what you will notice is that uh, different areas of the neocortex performs different functions. And this is uh, just uh, like uh, a sheet covering the uh, core module. And inside this sheet, there is a, uh, um, how I say, white matter, which is uh, connecting various uh, areas. So this is the uh, outside cover, which is called a gray matter. And inside there is a, a network of cables, 
connecting different areas. And we call this, um, how I say, the, let's say we say uh, one millimeter by one millimeter of the neocortex, and then we can call it uh, cortical columns. And as I said before, uh, different regions of brain perform different function. But let me introduce a common cortical algorithm or mini column hypothesis. It says maybe even though the different regions of brain perform different functions, each is uh, just the same universal module. So they are randomly initialized and they are updated with uh, experience. However, they have just a different connection. So if you get connection from the uh, hearing related connection like auditory vocal tract, then this area, even though it's the same, it performs a hearing function. If uh, this area, even though it's the same, is connected to a motion related area like a tactile area, proprioceptors and vision, then this performs a uh, movement related function. So then important question might be, what might be the function of this universal module? And many people conjecture that predicting the next vector given the sequence of vectors might be the fundamental underlying operation mechanisms of these common uh, cortical columns. Let me give you some concrete example. Let's say yesterday I load my, and you have to predict what words will come next. So yesterday I load, uh, there can be many words, but definitely not apple. Uh, yesterday I load my apple, it doesn't make sense. But uh, maybe yesterday I load my bicycle, makes sense. And then given this sequence, yesterday I load my bicycle as a sequence, let's predict what will come next. How about predicting two? Uh, yesterday I load my bicycle two, it makes sense. Yesterday I load my bicycle iPhone, does not make sense, right? Uh, what will become next? Yesterday I load my bicycle to class. So predicting what will come next actually can um, be a, a main mechanism for how we can uh, talk or write, things like that. Uh, this idea is not new, so uh, there are many models like this, and uh, GPT-3 nowadays is uh, really, uh, there are a lot of buzz. And what is remarkable about the GPT-3 is that GPT-3 wrote an article at the Guardian, the Guardian newspaper. So he wrote a co-ed uh, article at the Guardian, which is uh, like, uh, you can read it uh, on the right. I'm not a human, I'm, not, I'm a robot a thinking robot, I use only 0.12% of my cognitive capacity and things like that. If you uh, have time, uh, please search this article and read it. This is a quite pleasant reading. And this article, where GPT-3 wrote was given this prompt, I'm not a human, I'm an artificial intelligence. Many people think I'm a threat to humanity. Stephen Hawking has won that AI could spell the end of human race. I'm here to convince you not to worry. Artificial intelligence will not destroy humans, believe me. And what GPT-3 continuously did with was, what was will come next? And then given those words, what was might come next? And then what was will come next? That's how it wrote this uh, beautiful article. Okay, so this is a, a brilliant example of how prediction can be used to do many things. Uh, here is another example. Let's say you are seeing a person or a video and what your vision system might be doing is given this current frame, 
you can predict what will come next. And given this sequence, you can predict what will come next. And, and, and so on. So here you see a ground truth on top. So there is, was a person moving his hand down. And there are many different uh, algorithmic models that was trying to predict what comes next. So this was, is a, uh, how I say, state of the art model. And here I will just add one more uh, my idea that I think that will be probably missing and how we can overcome uh, by learning from the nature. So before that, let me introduce how did you build this kind of uh, brilliant models. So I uh, already gave you, uh, it is trend, trend like uh, yesterday I wrote my, uh, I'm predicting what will come next. Here you are seeing a model for such a, um, uh, uh, this is called attention model, uh, transformer model and that, that is how they built a uh, GPT-3. And what this model does is that given the uh, previous sequence of words as an input, yesterday I wrote my, and the model predict what word might be a good next word. And let's say it said yesterday I wrote my airplane and that was not ground truth. So there was an error. Now you have a desirable output, which is a bicycle and the error. And then you can update all the uh, models to make less errors next time. So you just adjust numbers a tiny bit uh, where each block in this diagram is a um, uh, large matrix and you update numbers such that next time when you see similar numbers, uh, the probability of airplane will go down and probability of saying bicycle will go up. This is how you build uh, current technology. And if you look at this, you update the whole network, which is uh, uh, billions of parameters based on the single objective. That is how we build our models nowadays. However, if we think about how humans behave here, uh, you are seeing uh, people walking and talking and drinking as you, we always do. And this person are seeing, meaning predicting what you will see next, hearing, predicting what you will hear next, talking, predicting what you will say next. So there are uh, many tests going parallelly on this. And can you optimize the whole network based on the single objective? Probably not. So that's, uh, you can see uh, how human brain is connected. It is uh, uh, heterarchically connected. And I am working on how we can make uh, these models to do multiple tests. The key idea is, uh, instead of updating whole models based on the single objective, each block here uh, will have their own local objective and they, uh, update, uh, they update the models based on their local objective such that we can achieve uh, multiple tasks. That is the, uh, my research uh, direction. And let's go to the uh, second be uh, part of the behavior, which is the uh, instinct. So uh, instincts are governed in the everything else than the neocortex and cerebellum. So again, here, if we look at the uh, brain models. So I said the outside is a shit, which is a neocortex which uh, is a uniform and learned by behavior. Inside this brain, there are uh, many, uh, how I say, uh, many uh, complex mechanisms like a hippocampus, hypothalamus, amygdala, and things like that here. So uh, 
we call it uh, as a salmon course is a living system or there are other systems, but we might say uh, instinct is um, conducted by the everything else than the neocortex and the cerebellum part. Uh, one thing I would like to emphasize again is that contrary to our devotion to learning, there are many learning if you are on this field, like machine learning, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning, self-supervised learning, and so on. Most behaviors are driven by instinct. And instinct even determines what can be learned or how we can learn. So the important question might be what instincts enable language? Uh, another way of expressing this is that uh, we can say humans are monkeys with a few more instincts, like a language instinct. And monkeys are just have a little more instinct than dogs or cats. They uh, have uh, something like a social instincts that enables observational learning and other things. So let me uh, introduce with uh, one concrete example. So uh, this is we humans focus on the moving thing. So imagine there is a fly flying around you or around you. So you will uh, focus on the moving thing. That's how we evolve. So uh, our human eyes focus immediately to moving things by instinct that is given. However, if you have uh, recruit a few monkeys and give them uh, sugar water like a cola and train them such that uh, when there is a moving object in one part of the screen, you can actually train them to look at other direction. Uh, we humans also can learn that. Uh, so this is called anti-saccade test. So the capability that there is an instinct behavior where we focusing on the uh, moving target, which is a pro saccade. So that this is uh, given by the instinct. And there is a uh, behavior that is learned by uh, reward that is actually moving away from the moving target. So uh, primates or humans have a system where they can modulate the learned behavior and instinctive behavior. That will be a, a example decision uh, instinct that will enable uh, higher level behavior. And here I just briefly uh, summarized a few uh, instincts that will be required for learning language. So definitely we need a minimal reflexes like uh, walking, uh, talking, sucking, and event memory consolidation, decision system, social instinct, and knowledge instinct, language instinct, those uh, instincts are currently missing in the current state of the art machine learning approach. So in current state of art, they try to learn everything from the scratch, but what might be more, uh, missing here is there might be a, a learning component and there is an instinct component and how we can modulate between those two will be also important question. So let me wrap up here. So uh, today I talked about the uh, theory, test and model for human level AI. Theory, uh, we defined what is uh, intelligence, what is uh, human level intelligence, and what do we mean by the learning with a language? And at the test part, we proposed uh, how we can build a sufficient but tractable uh, test for human level AI. And we introduced our ongoing effort to build a simulated environment to administer those tests uh, practically. And at the final part of the uh, model, uh, we 
briefly reviewed how human brains learn and try to uh, extract lessons for the current uh, machine learning approach. The two main ideas was instead of using backpropagation to do end-to-end -end learning, uh, we should uh, build a different approach that relies on online parallel uh, optimization of the individual modules and also how we can merge the learned behavior and instinctive behavior will be an important uh, challenge for uh, our uh, uh, effort to build a human level AI. Thank you for your attention. This is uh, my student, Aishriya Potkula, uh, Asha Dajman, Rubel Mondor, and Majraul Islam. And that's it. That is the uh, end of my talk. You can learn uh, more about my research at the uh, top. I included a few paper link here. Thank you for your attention. Um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Professor Park. Uh, this is a very you know, interesting discussion, uh, presentation. Uh, I'm sure uh, the audience were, uh, you know, learned a lot of things, you know, <laughs> about how AI is uh, shaping up into the future. Um, so I'm going to ask the audience to type their questions into the chat window, and I'm going to read them out. We have at least about 10, 15 minutes left. So I see one question already, so let me read it out. And uh, if we need any clarifications, uh, we can ask the questioner for more details. So it's very interesting, that's the comment. The writing by GTP3 comes from GTP3's thinking or the thinking of a human who made GTP3. How did GTP3 practice thinking and building and build thinking capacity. So did okay, they want uh, to read it out or was the question clear? Oh uh, yeah, uh, yes. So uh, let me explain here. So uh, this is, let me, inter oh, that is a very good question. So let me explain a little more detail about how you can build a program that can write on uh, Guardian, Coed, uh, Opiate. So the way the GPT-3 was trained was, let's say you scrap all the article in the internet, okay? All the newspaper, Wikipedia, uh, general homepage, you just scrap all the text, like all the books human has written. Okay, now you have a, a lot of text, right? And how you train GPT-3 is, let's say you are given a book and you train GPT-3 to predict what words will come next on this book, okay? So that way, if you use the whole article that is on the text format, the GPT-3 actually learned to imitate how humans might write. And what do I mean by the imitation part is that at every time when you see the character sequence, yesterday I wrote my, then at this point, GPT-3 uh, will think about what was might come next. And assign probability to each prediction. For example, car will have a high probability, bicycle, high probability, but might not um, apple or banana or uh, iPhone, those words will have a lower probability. In that sense, no human thought uh, how GPT-3 should think, but GPT-3 used the statistical pattern of how humans write and uh, expressed it. So, uh, do I make sense? I mean, I think you sort of do, uh, but I have a follow-up question here. At the end of the day, you're still using 
uh, you know, data to learn uh, what mm -hmm. the answer is. So this is still learning, right? Learning based mm -hmm. AI. It's not exactly mm -hmm. instinct based AI or or something different, right? So do you agree that uh, this is, uh, you know, connected with learning based mm -hmm. AI? Oh, yeah. Oh, so definitely. Uh, I think learning and instinct both are important. However, uh, learning and learning, it is more important how we find the underlying principle well. Okay. And the GPT, things like GPT-3 relies on the principle called attention model. And this principle, uh, if we keep finding and refining those kind of principles, that is how we can solve this learning problem that we need to solve. And instinct part is a different, <coughs> uh, how I say, universe of the problem. Here, they might not have the, how I say, uh, clean universal principle that will be applied to uh, all instincts. Instead, you will have to engineer each component of the instinct module. It's like a bend, bending machine. So you have to write a simple, but simple component, but you have to write a many component. Compared to that, the neocortex, where uh, it is related to learning, they might be related to a uh, universal principle. And if we can derive those universal principles, then uh, we will uh, more easily solve, uh, we will solve uh, this problem of learning more effectively. And the GPT-3 relies on the assumption, which is that uh, the main task is predicting what will come next. And I agree with the GPT-3's approach to that. However, if we want, want to go beyond GPT-3, then there are questions like, uh, oh, but GPT-3 was trained to optimize for predicting next word or next images, but humans have a multiple objective. And if you have a multiple objective, how we can update the network, how we can compose the network. Those are uh, the, how I say, research question that I am interested in. Do I make sense? Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'm going to read out a couple of more questions, uh, Degan. So the next question is, uh, is there any source, open source or websites that I can <laughs> implement human level AI? Uh, so, Cedro is open source, uh, so you can download and test Cedro. Cedro is uh, just an environment, so there might be a, a thing that I can point to you. And for the uh, the actual model part, it is not implemented yet, so it it will require some uh, army of geniuses to build on a model that can actually solve those tests. So uh, you can refer the uh, archive article that I showed in the talk, and there is a, a link to the GitHub where you can download the environment and play with it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, moving along, uh, this question from Tucker Sparkman. Is there any research for AI that can program or expand itself? Hmm. So I think that is a little uh, difficult question because the question in the question it says program or expand itself. So uh, it is a uh, mm, because human languages are not so good for uh, this kind of approach. 
a program or expand itself. There has been long history called evolutionary algorithm, which tries to mimic how uh, mutation happens and update to solve the problem. There has been a few approaches and for that, I think uh, for your question, I would say uh, evolutionary algorithm uh, seems most re relevant to programming or expand itself. But expanding itself is uh, a little, there can be many different way of uh, expanding. So maybe we can talk offline about what do you mean by the uh, expanding. Uh, so the question, uh, next question is, uh, well, somebody is asking for a clarification. Uh, how mm -hmm. do you spell CEDRO? Is it S-E-D-R-O or C-E-D-R-O? S-E-D-R-O, Simulated Environment for Developmental Robotics. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question is, uh, for someone learning a second or third language, how does your model work? Uh, so uh, I would say that is a quite challenging question. So uh, I'm not expert on the second language acquisition. So there has been many uh, linguists or developmental psychologists who studied second language acquisition is different from the first language acquisition. So I'm sorry, I am not expert in that area. For me, first language acquisition is already too challenging for me. So I am devoting all my uh, attention to that. So I'm not uh, well, uh, I do not know enough about the second or third language acquisition. Okay, thank you. So um, one, uh... Somebody from the audience wants to know whether you can share your PowerPoint or article archive. I mean, the, the stock is, uh, you know, recorded, so you'll be able to view this, but in specifically mm -hmm. if somebody wants your PowerPoint, would that be available? Uh, yeah, uh, so yeah, uh, there is an uh, archive article you can refer. Uh, so I don't know how I can show it. If you Oh, no, I mean, I think I would then. suggest that uh, you know how to reach Professor Park uh, by email, mm -hmm. you know, just send him a request later on and I'm sure he'd be happy to share whatever he can. Sure, sure. Okay. Uh, we have s some more questions, so obviously a very exciting uh, talk for people. So this question is human intelligence has been developing over the years by evolution. However, evolution focuses on survival. So is learning just restricted to mathematics and how can current learning approaches incorporate both symbolic learning and survival? Mm, that is a tough question. So, so however, evolution focuses on survival. So is learning just restricted to mathematics and how can you is learning just restrict to mathematics? So I'm not sure uh, is learning. So basically there can be many aspects of the learning or human as a, as a biological agent. However, what we are trying to build is ex extract some of the principles of the human and express them in a mathematical formulation such that we can use it on our artificial intelligence or program or robot uh, to do some intelligent behavior. So uh, I think there might be a very complex mechanisms uh, involved in the actual human, human learning, but what we might need is uh, some uh, fundamental mathematical principles that we can apply to programming uh, a robot. 
So that is, will be my question. And how can current learning approaches incorporate both symbolic learning and survival? So let me uh, explain this way. So you know there is a, a program that plays Atari games or playing Go, okay? And those programs are trained using the reinforcement learning. And what is the reinforcement learning? Each agent plays the game at first randomly, and it might receive a score or a reward. And when it dies, you get a, how I say, your score, record, record score. And the program tries to optimize the control algorithm such that you get higher score. And if you look at this in a, a biological perspective, each individual uh, episode can be thought as a life of a biological agent. So a biological uh, agent played Atari game and died. And you can think which agent, which way of playing Atari game resulted in the best Atari playing algorithms. So you can say uh, the current reinforcement learning is very similar to the learning with the evolutionary algorithm where survival is important because the more you survive, the higher you will score. Having said that, here the different words is uh, symbolic learning, okay? So symbolic learning is uh, uh, totally, so symbolic learning happen very later in the learning hierarchy. So learning with a survival algorithm, you learn the earthworms, level one intelligence, learned with uh, uh, that approach. And level two intelligence, it actually uh, tried and get reward and updated. And at level three, you see what other agents are doing. And at the top, there is a human level intelligence, which uses a symbolic uh, symbol, uh, sequence of symbols to learn. And you should that think that everything learns on the survival idea, but this symbolic learning is a mechanism that enable uh, high level behavior during the life cycle, life time of an agent. If a biological agent uh, lives forever, then we can start from the earthworm and we can learn everything to human level if we live infinitely. However, we humans live only at most 100 years. And you have to learn a lot in, during short, in this short time. So uh, you cannot start from the earthworm to be able to learn computer science or quantum <laughs> physics. You should learn from the uh, abstract learning. So symbolic learning is a way of reducing the time required to uh, learn a high level behavior. So I would say survival is like an iceberg and symbolic learning is like a tip of iceberg. So that is the how I would like to say and current learning approaches uh, incorporate, they try to incorporate both both, yeah, but uh, uh, it's uh, um, there can be a um, different many pre uh, many different approaches for how we can incorporate that. Maybe we can discuss more uh, in offline if you are interested, because it might require some uh, back and forth discussion. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think we have uh, you know, gone a little bit beyond the one hour alerted to this uh, 
presentation. So we will have to regretfully uh, stop the discussion right now. I mean, I can see a lot of new questions coming in. So obviously, you know, there's a lot of interest from the audience. Uh, so those who did not get their questions uh, asked or read out, uh, please feel free to contact Dr. Park. Uh, you know, uh, you know how to reach him, his email address, and I'm sure he'll be happy to share his insights and answer your questions. Uh, so with this, uh, let us thank uh, Dr. Park uh, for giving this amazing uh, you know, talk and uh, appreciate your time here. And uh, we will be continuing this uh, presentation series uh, uh, throughout the semester. So uh, stay tuned for the next exciting set of talks and I'll be hosting some of them. So look forward to seeing most of you again next time. Thank you very much. Thank you guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Uh, das. Thank you.